We're back. Hello, everyone. Happy Monday morning. Yes, everyone, even Kathy from HR. She's got some pep in her step. She's ready to face the day. And in honor of her, we have another episode of Crowdfunding Countdown, where we take a look at every single board game campaign finishing up this week, or as I like to call this week, Dead by Daylight, the board game, and a bunch of other things you've never heard of and probably won't end up backing. Not necessarily. There are a couple, but but yeah. But yes, necessarily. <laughs> These sorts of weeks terrify me because I know that there will inevitably be an onslaught to follow. But first off, before we get into the game, shout out to my newest patron, Travis. Thank you so much for jumping on board. And thank you, Eric. You know why. I am honored that you have decided to join the room and board family, the no money, no brains family. Yeah, I bet you didn't know you signed up for that title, did you? Welcome to being able to vote on which games get burned for all of time over on the Discord. And thank you again, as always, to all of my patrons for supporting the channel. You're all friggin' fantastic. I've been very reflective of the awesome community we've built and how much fun I have over on our Discord. And it's just, yeah, it's a great time. It really means a lot, your continued support, and I like you all quite a bit. It's the truth. I'm as mushy as a mashed potato right now. So let's get into the games, or at least games that give the faintest inkling of how they are played. So sorry, Murder by Moonlight, you're disqualified because of that criteria. And I was so excited to do a whole film noir bit. She walked into my office, like a seal in high heels. I of course wanted to work with Private investigator Paul Eagle, who never sleeps, literally never sleeps until the job is over. I mean, I don't know how long the game is. It's probably like an hour. That's not, that's not a feat, Paul. I just think you could commit a little bit more than the bare minimum of, of not falling asleep in one to two hours. But it's already on his business cards, so I guess that's what Paul Eagle gets you. Anyway, this one looked like an escape room type game, but uh, that's all I could tell. So we're not talking about that one. And we're, of course, not talking about the fully automated board game. We haven't officially started the episode whatsoever, which has got the outline of a party game where there are two sides and there are bosses and employees and the bosses are basically flogging their workers and the workers can go on strike, but you also still need to make money to pay the rent or whatever. It's uh, very depressing. <laughs> and uh, you wanna overthrow your bosses or overthrow the other side or be better. I don't know, I wish I could tell you, I like that sketch of an outline, but I do not believe people should back on a sketch of an outline alone. Give me some rules, give me some play tests. And that's why we're not talking about that one either. And hey, if that sketch of an outline did sound interesting, well then just check out Coup Reformation, which can play up to 10 players and you have opposing sides and you're trading sides every time. Anyway, because I am not talking about these two, I am not including their links in the links below. So I'm not even gonna tempt you to click on their campaign pages to see the paltry amount of information that I spent too long <laughs> trying to figure out if they were worth including. So the first thing we are going to talk about today <laughs> is not a board game, but it is in fact a board game accoutrement, and that is these levitating dice. And these are ridiculously cool, but also ridiculously expensive. I feel like I, it is my duty to tell you this right up front before you get sucked in by how cool they are, like I did, and then realize that it's $89 US for one single dice. One single D20 in a base, and of course a power cord, they give you the power cord, is $89 or $113 Canadian. And that's outrageous. It's a horrible price point, and I know nobody in their right mind should even think about purchasing these things. And yet, of course, I also know the type of audience who are listening to these crowdfunding countdowns, and, and I know you want it. I know it. So that's why I'm including it here in case it strikes your fancy and you have that disposable income to spend. And to be fair, this has certainly put my own levitating dice company out of business, which is where I would come to your house, or somebody would come to your house. We'd cut a hole in the bottom of your table and then just blow with all of our might as hard as we can on command. Yes, that strange sound coming from below your friend's gaming tables was me or a member of my staff huffing and puffing. It's time to come clean. And yes, I realize now that below the table blow boys was not the best name or marketing decision to refer to ourselves by. Anyway, this one works by magic 
And by that, I mean, of course, magnets. There are these magnets in the base, and then there's a magnet in the dice that just propels it and lets it sit there. And it's just, it's so cool. It's so cool. Never going to get it. You can slide non-metallic things underneath it. So most hands and pieces of paper can just whoosh right underneath. You pick it up and you're raw. I mean, it's really cool but it's, it's outrageously expensive. But I, I'm just, I think it's cool that a company is doing something like this and that people are getting it. If it weren't that expensive, I would absolutely get it to have it floating in the background. But good news for my salt lamp, it gets to stay. <laughs> anyway, if you are a millionaire and are interested in that party trick, check it out that finishes this Wednesday at 9.58 a.m. Now, next up, we have a party game called Made Up Movies, which begs the question, doesn't anyone have a unique idea anymore? Why can't Hollywood come up with something original rather than Harold and Kumar go to White Castle rebooted for the 12th time? <laughs> Although I guess we do have to admit that that is a timeless tale of perseverance in the face of me never watching it. Anyway, that's kind of the premise for this party game. And you can tell that it is a funny, fun party game because they have the same laugh track on, on a loop in the video showing you that it will get consistent laughs, which is something we all desperately crave for. Or maybe that's just me. But I do actually think this is a good concept, which is why I'm talking about it. Basically, you get an existing movie title along with criteria of how it will be remade. And then you have a timer to come up with the funny name for this string of things being included in this reboot of the film. And then everyone else gets to throw you curveballs by asking you ridiculous questions or making you do ridiculous things to add to your pitch, <laughs> just like the time Harold and Kumar had to pretend they were each other's mothers so the cops would let them go. <laughs> Again, I haven't seen it. But then once everybody's gone and everyone's pitched their movie and come up with a name and done their zany interactions, you assign your budget cards and it's basically voting. You're giving points to whatever you like the best and the best movie wins, to whatever gets the biggest budget wins. And I do, I really like that it isn't very long. I like that it is this one round thing that that's almost a really big selling point for me. It's kind of like a better snake oil, or <laughs> like that time that Harold fell into that snake pit and had to wriggle out of his clothes because of course they were made out of snake skin. And you know it was mating season. <laughs> Try telling that to the Knights of the White Castle. Anyway, it's 25 bucks US or $32 Canadian, and I actually think that this is a really nice price point for this type of game. Often you'll see these games at a much larger price point, and I like seeing it at what feels more like a budget-friendly version, or just an adequately assessing the replay value and the enjoyment factor of your game. I think it hits exactly at that point. So if you like interactive party games where you do have to come up with things on the fly, then check this one out, this, this might be for you. But I really think this should also be catered towards that sort of cinephile audience who know the in and outs of the genre and can really think outside the jack in the box. What a buy this would be for you. Hardy anyone who truly loves cinema should miss this one. So checkers it out if you think you might be interested. Shake Shack. Although there is no shipping estimate, which uh, I hate. I hate that so much. But they are clear that it is going to be U.S. only. So I assume they're shipping domestically, and that's the reason why it is U.S. only. So I, I'm banking that it won't be outrageous because it will get to them, and then they'll ship it out. But still, beware. Anyway, if you are interested in that one, that is Wednesday at 10.25 a.m. Now, next up, we have a game called Kingdoms Rise and Fall Dorian. And this is a deck builder, a deck builder with area control. And it says it can take however long you like from 1.5 hours or adjust the length so it takes you eight hours. No, <laughs> stop that right now, stop it. <laughs> If it takes 1.5 hours, then it should take 1.5 hours. Anyway, it is a deck builder, so you're going to be constantly adding these three type of cards, stealth cards, magic cards, and battle cards, all which combo in different ways to your deck in order to take over certain spots on the board, which will give you influence points, and you play to a set number of influence points. That's why you can play till eight hours, because you just set it at, nah, let's just set it at 100. Let's set it at 1,000. I don't know if you, can, you can't get that many because you get points by taking over strategic locations on the board. And the main selling point here is that when you are attacking a place, it doesn't matter where everyone else is on the board, they can always still participate in the fight. So they can choose to join your side and 
help you take it over and get some bonuses associating with being on the winning side and the attacker side, or they can choose to defend the city against your siege to deny you points, they also get some additional bonuses as well. And this idea, I don't think I like it because it reminds me a lot of Cosmic Encounter and I don't really like the battle system in that either. It obviously benefits you to partake in most of the battles. And if you're playing with a larger group, in this place three to six, there's really nothing stopping everyone from just being on the defense side and saying, nope, you don't get any points ever to certain players. Or being on the attacker side and then just partaking in the spoils. I think this one is slightly better because if you win, it doesn't seem like you also get the influence points. I think you get the influence points from owning the spot. So I like that. I, I dislike in Cosmic Encounter, everyone could just join on the attacker side and add their ships to the planet and basically get one of the five points that you need to win. So in this one, I fear it will veer towards the other side where everyone's just on the defensive side because you want to hinder your opponent and that just sort of slowing down for the sake of slowing down, eh, I don't know. But I like deck building, I like variable player powers and each character gets their own little unique abilities and their unique starting card, although to be fair, when you create your deck, likely you're gonna be getting random cards anyway because you're constantly drawing them from the different decks so that original starting card probably won't feel as significant or as exciting as it might. So if you like the Cosmic Encounter battle system, which I specifically do not, uh, this one is a little bit uh, more engaging but it still feels like it'll come down to the numbers that you have in your hand versus the strength that you can add or the strength that you can add against defense. Maybe check it out. It's not a horrible price point. It's 49 euros, $67 Canadian, but the shipping is very bad, especially to North America. So it just feels like a hard pass. But if you are interested, hey, check it out. That's Thursday at 9 a.m. Now, next up we have Feralis, Obscure Lands. And move over, Dorian. We've got deck construction versus your pathetic little deck building. The difference between those two, of course, is that you mostly can do your construction before the game begins versus as the game is happening. I prefer deck building versus deck construction, but here we are. It's tough living in the world of Feralis and living on the planet Mork. Certainly never been easy, and it is also not easy to scroll through this campaign page either. I mean, this game has great art, it looks exciting, it looks like Magic the Gathering but better and doesn't cost thousands of dollars. But it makes me less excited as the campaign page just scrolls and scrolls and scrolls on by, showing me expansions and no specifics and specifically no additional pictures of Mork, who's pretty much the selling point. This also claims to be a one to four player game, but like whatever that one was, too many bones unbreakable, they're lying to you, you need to purchase an expansion. It is basically a two player game until you purchase that, at least judging from what I have seen. And that drives me crazy, it drove me crazy when Chip Theory did it, it drives me crazy now. Say what you are on your campaign page, do not misinform people who are, may pick up your game without looking into it, although, Honestly, you didn't look into it, so... Uh, but still, this sort of marketing I hate. Anyway, the game itself. You start with 20 life and you're trying to reduce your opponent to zero. Very similar to Magic. And the main difference or the main unique mechanic here is that you're going to play a card, but you're going to play it in its call state or its awaken state. But the cost for playing it isn't really mana, it's the amount of turns you have to wait for it actually to appear on the field. So it starts in this little incubator and it goes forward. But the thing about this system as well, and I like the two different, the two different options, but if you put it in its call state and it dies, it then goes back to the incubator and will emerge in its awakened state because it's a harder, more terrifying monster. But if you put it in its awakened state right off the bat, you still have to wait the same amount of turns as you do for the awakened state. But then when it dies, it goes to your graveyard. So I don't really see any point of ever playing something immediately into its awakened state. I guess that's kind of a later on determination if you've teched up and the little monsters don't cut it anymore in terms of how the battlefield is laid out. But it just feels way more efficient to play at one and then have it bounce back and forth. I don't know, I like that concept. You also have unique powers that have the same sort of incubation state as well. So if you like the dormant 
ability in Hearthstone where you play a character and you gotta wait until something activates it, well then you might like this game because it's basically all structured around that. Or there's another game that kind of reminds me of it. It's a head-to-head -head two player card game. Um, so it's just like Duel Monsters. Yeah, maybe it was that. Anyway, this is 43 euros, $59 Canadian. Plus shipping is eh, bad if you're not in Europe. But if you're interested, check it out. That's Thursday at 12.30 noon. Now, next up, we have a game called Traders and Raiders. And if you ever wanted a Kickstarter video to just shout rules at you in a way that to make sure you'd never understand it, well, have I got the Herald and Kumar for you. This rule book is honestly atrocious, and the art is not interesting. And this is, this is just past its goal. It had a small goal. It has 21 backers who are in who have made this a success. But I really think those 21 backers will enjoy this game a lot. You're basically, as far as I can tell, running around from town to town trying to be the first person to build buildings in that town so you get more points than everybody else and protect the town from monsters. But it's all of this cycle of going to different places and trading resources into better resources or into more resources that you can use more efficiently. And I, I don't know, strangely, it seems, I can see that there is a decent game underneath this very hard to understand rule book. I like the action selection system here too. I think that's kind of cool. It's kind of a group action selection system. You play something and everybody gets to take that action. But if you pay something, then you can take that action solo, which I think is a neat twist on that similar mechanic. Anyway, this one's 52 bucks US or $66 Canadian, and there's no shipping in info, so it really should be a hard pass for everyone. And yet, I don't know why, but I am strangely compelled by this game. So check it out if you are interested. That finishes on Thursday at 7.18 p.m. Now, next up, we have the Big Pig Game. <laughs> Where, of course, you want to be the biggest pig that ever pigged and eat all of the snacks before your humans get home. It's a freaky food for all. Now, I've been to one of those, and that's very different from what this game is. But they do have one thing in common, which is you're all working together <laughs> to get the most food eaten. To get all the food gone, basically. Wherever you can put it. Which also thematically doesn't feel like what would happen when humans leave the house because as any multiple pet owner knows, probably all hell breaks loose. There's not a coordinated strike. It's every pet for themselves. Anyway, in this one there's a bunch of tiles that make up a picture and each tile has a little hunger rating associated with it that you have to achieve to eat it. And on your turn you get to choose one of four actions and you put your little action token on it and then you can choose actions that you haven't put your action token on. So basically, you don't actually get to choose what actions you get to take, you get to choose the order in which you get to take actions, which disappoints me a lot. It, it, it makes the freedom of play that much smaller, and I'm sure it's probably for balance issues so you don't just keep on eating over and over again because that's probably the optimal action considering that's your goal of the game. But I don't know, it's... it's uh, it's a little bit disappointing. And so this seems okay, but it seems a little bit basic. It's $45 US or $57 Canadian. Shipping to the US is 12 to $14, so maybe it's worth it for you. I don't think it is. I, and anywhere else is absolutely not worth it. But hey, if that's too much for you, you can also get a goodie pack of stickers for $15 US or $19 Canadian. And I just, ah, I just wish games would stop doing this. It is a bad idea. Nobody ever goes for it. They have three backers at this level. Nobody wants stickers for for a game that they don't own. Also, all you're doing is you're creating a lower price point that people get to scroll and look at first, thinking, oh, the game costs this much. No, it doesn't. Oh, it actually costs more than double that. Wow, now I'm disappointed and I'm not gonna purchase the game. Geez, I really wish this game was $15. That's all I'm thinking when I see that that is a price point. It's just a bad idea. I hate when it happens. Because I also get excited, I go, oh, okay, yeah, for 15 bucks, maybe this, oh, it's $45, bah. Anyway, if you are interested in that one, that finishes Thursday at 9 p.m. Now, next up, we have Dead by Daylight. <gasps> the creme de la creme this week, or at least the creme de la creme in terms of funding raised. This is a horror survival board game based upon the video game series. And it also holds the world record for making everyone who sees the Kickstarter realize why most Kickstarter videos are animated and not just pictures of your little minis hanging from hooks like inanimate Legos. <laughs> I don't know, I find this video very funny because it's very ominous music as you just 
push in on these tiny figures that, that clearly won't hurt you. It really made me laugh, just the suspense that it attempts to build in these kind of silly situations. But hey, it's raised over one million dollars Canadian, so I don't have to do a five reasons you shouldn't back, because our dollar is very poor, but it also emphasizes why I should go on Survivor and win it, because that conversion will be in my favor. That million bucks would buy me one board game campaign. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry, I did stop the screen recording on this video before the jump scare at the end, so to make it up for you, I will include no less than four jump scares in this video from this point forward. Starting with this one, be careful, this is your warning, here it comes. Woof, gotcha. Anyway, this is a one versus all experience. So one player will play the killer and their goal is to get eight sacrifices and sacrifice eight figures onto their little meat hooks. Or you can play as the heroes and your goal is to find four generators, get those all fixed, fix the exit as well, and then you're allowed to leave. Now here comes jump scare number two. So, you know, get ready to be shocked. Boo. But I actually really, really appreciate this campaign. They lead with the rules. And so many campaigns don't do that. So many campaigns just want you to see, oh, look at all this shiny stuff. Don't look at how much it's gonna cost you. Just look at the bling and get frothing at the mouth. And this doesn't do that. This makes you actively not want it whatsoever. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, this leads with the rules. And I just think that's fantastic. It gives you a sense right off the bat of what you are getting and that it is a very simplistic rule set as well, at a very cheap price for the retail version. Sure, the collector's edition is 99 bucks US, they gotta go for that, and of course everybody on Kickstarter is getting that version, but the retail version is $49 US, and that's great. That's a small price point for what Kickstarter tends to be, especially with these IP-driven games. I mean, keep in mind there are no stretch goals, so this is literally just a pre-order system, so likely, it will be available at retail and so you won't have to buy the shipping and that's why people are going for the collector's edition instead of the retail because if you are getting it at retail just wait until the retail the collector's edition will give you additional minis and additional villains and characters and some of course the little mini hooks which uh, seem essential at this point in the game. I don't think it is necessarily worth double the price plus the 16 to 24 dollars in shipping but a lot of people seem to, so that's great. Anyway, we haven't even talked about the game, and I'm sorry about that, I'm completely out of order. The gameplay itself is this. Everybody secretly chooses a movement card, and you're gonna use that movement card to go to adjacent places on the map. But the killer gets to pick two movement cards, and then you all reveal them at the same time. And of course, you could talk to each other around the table, but then that killer that you invited to board game night, strange decision, honestly, just sitting in the corner with knives sticking out of their head, blood dripping down their body, scars covered all over their body, staring at you, waiting to stab you and hang you on their hooks, would be able to hear what you're trying to coordinate with your team. So I like that sort of thing where you want to communicate and you can't communicate. And that's basically the entire game. You're gonna move to a place, check out if you found a generator or not. Is the killer there? Are they gonna slash you up or sacrifice you? No, rinse and repeat. Just make sure you're not destined for the hooks. Ugh. See, I know I, I jump scared you there. But that's it, it's an incredibly basic game. And so that's why I really don't think it needs a collector's edition because the gameplay is just so basic. Or maybe that's why it does need the collector's edition because then you get the additional roles, but they're gonna be the kind of the same anyway. I don't know. Fans of the video games seem to be really thrilled about this. It's gotten a lot of funding, so they must be doing something right with this very simple atmosphere. I think it's a little bit too simple for me, not something I would return to over and over again. But if you are interested, hey, check it out. That is Thursday at 9 p.m. Now, next up, we have a game called Kaikoro, which is a roll and write where you're roll and fighting these five giant kaijus who are attempting to walk their way towards your city and just destroy it completely. And you have to deal damage to the five kaijus who are hell-bent on approaching your city, doing what kaijus do best, jump scare. See, I told you we'd get four. <laughs> and jumping all over your city and citizens, and that would certainly scare me. So the game's pretty basic. You have three dice, you roll it. The red dice will tell you which kaiju you can attack this turn, and then you use the other two dice, they're all d6s, six-sided die, to 
punch them to deal damage to them in certain places. And they all have their own little individual numbers that you have to cross out. And this person who gets the most hits wins. And this made me skeptical at first, but the hits are just the victory points. And so there are ways to collect these hits as you, of course, make your way along the journey towards striking its heart. Because if there is one way to kill a kaiju, it is, of course, making a fake dating profile online and starting to exchange messages with them. You're not interested in how many cities they've smashed to bits. You're interested in getting to know them as a monster. You're different than all the others. You care about their interests. Mothra wanted to be a painter. Godzilla, well, Godzilla's into exotic cuisine and wants to open up a surf shop just on the outskirts of town. King Kong is, well, no, okay, King Kong is just a perv looking for a short skirt. That's, that's King Kong's MO. But to really take down a kaiju, you gotta get to know them. You learn their interests. You support their passion. Suddenly, they don't wanna be a city-destroying monster anymore because you've made the hurt go away. They're smiling for the first time. They can't wait to meet you. You say, hey, why don't we just meet at your house? We're both homebodies after all. They, of course, agree. The two of you just want a quiet night in. You get their address, then decide it might be fun to go for a night on the town. Oh, come on, Kraken. I know I can finally convince you to dance. You may have two left feet, but you got six right ones. I think I finally found the right one. They go to meet you downtown. They're wearing a little red rose so you know that it's them. They're the monster you, you've been talking to all this time, but you don't show up. You're caught in traffic, you say. Instead, you make your way to their house. You take all their prized possessions that you know they love and put them in a pile right inside the front door. Set up a trap so that it starts lighting on fire the moment they walk in. Desperate, alone, sad from being rejected because you never showed up on that date. You've stood them up. They're monsters. They'll never find love. They come back home, dejected, heartbreaking, only to find all of their prized possessions now erupting in flames. This sends them into a rage. Then they remember the medication that their doctor prescribed to them when they are getting overwhelmed and antsy. They head to the medicine cabinet. It's on fire too. They manage to grab the bottle, burning their hands in the process, gulping down the medicine, gulping down the only thing that might ease their pain and numb their anxiety one more time. Popping those pills as their life crumbles around them. Turns out you're also a kaiju doctor. You went to school for 10 years and established a successful practice with a great reputation. All the humans had looked on at you with disgust. They think that you turned away from your own kind. Little do they know, you did it for them. You've been prescribing them incorrect medication for years. You finally swapped the pills in a sort of baking soda and bleach situation. The medicine explodes inside them. Their heart is starting to burst. They fall to the ground. They see your silhouette standing in the doorway, illuminated by flames. You say a pithy one-liner as you crouch down beside them, showing them your dating profile. Honey, I'm home. You've done it again. You've taken out the kaiju and saved your town. Only four more to go. I mean, your profile was literally a giant catfish. Honestly, it's on them if they didn't see it coming. So yeah, the moral of the story, you want to take down a kaiju, you go for its heart. Anyway, it's five bucks US, seven dollars Canadian to get yourself the sheet that you can print out as many copies as you like and play with as many people as you like. So if that interests you, check it out. <laughs> That finishes Monday at 12 p.m. noon. Now, next up we have Mall Peak, which is an asymmetrical tactical game for two players. One player plays the Grizzar, who in this case are a bunch of bears that don't kidnap people's family members, which the bears of this world could learn a thing or two about. And then the other player plays a giant monster, uh, a kaiju, if you will that the Grizzar have to overcome. So of course, as the Grizzar, you're going to make a fake profile online, worm your way into this monster's heart, Wait a minute, feels like we've done this before. Anyway, I love for this one that there are two little boards, one for the earth that where you're doing the battle on and the, the monster is moving around with its little meeple, and then one for the specific monster as well that the Grizzar are gonna have to climb up and target specific weak points. And that of course, if the monster eats you, you go into its little cage. They call it a cage, but it's, it's their stomach. You clearly have all the bears in your stomach and uh, you can't get them out. So on your turn, each turn, each person's turn, you're gonna have a set number of actions depending on the characters that you take. And the gameplay is pretty simple. You're gonna have a hand of cards. You can play a card and choose either the top or the bottom. So they have variability in what you can do. You can discard a card to draw two cards and, and get more cards that way or get 
the cards that you really need to deliver that finishing blow, or you can intensify, you can get rid of a card and get yourself a little rage token, which can be used for other various actions, basically. Those are your three set actions, and you're gonna be moving around tactically on a board, trying to get into the right space and the right location to deliver your attacks and be the person to come out on top. And this seems like a really nice, simple system and one that I am actually quite interested to try as you maneuver around, but this is the sister game of Skulk Hollow. Both of these are compatible, both of these are asymmetrical two-player tactical games, and you can take the fox in from the first game, that's the basically the Grizzar faction, they're the faction that was involved in there, and you can cross them with whatever guardians or monsters that you have in the second one. And the fact that you can do that means to me that they are similar enough. You don't need to get this one right now. You can just go out and get Skulk Hollow if that interests you. Or if you really love Skulk Hollow, then hey, you're probably already decided that I want to support this company and I want to get this thing. And that's cool. They do give you a few upgrades, nice little token upgrades, which is nice, and a little mini solo narrative expansion as well that they've thrown in there, which isn't something that necessarily appeals to me, but they are doing as much as they can, I think, to make it worth paying that extra shipping and paying that extra kind of Kickstarter cost. But I can get Skull Colo at my local game store for $45 Canadian, and this is $45 US or $57 Canadian for probably a very similar experience, plus the shipping on top of that. So that's why I'm like, it's a pass for me. But if you are interested, hey, check it out. That finishes Tuesday at 12 a.m., AKA Monday night. And finally, we have a game called Silicon Valley, which is by Scott Alms, who is most well known for the Tiny Epic series. He's done a lot of games in that, maybe all of them. I didn't check. And this is also produced by Grail Games who the last Kickstarter that they did was back in August called The Gardens, and that was one that I remembered. That was my pick for the week that week. It beat Black Rose Wars Rebirth. So I think they've been doing some really nice stuff, and I think Silicon Valley actually looks like a pretty cool game. And this is a very simple game about making one billion dollars. Easy. <laughs> And so in order to do that and to create your company be valued at a billion dollars over in Silicon Valley, you're going to have to hire employees who are going to constantly give you these little polyomino bits of code that you can then use those bits of code to throw into new products. Why, yes, this code was going to be for the electric blender, but now we're using it in our self-driving car. What could go wrong? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. That's how code works. And you're going to get to keep your money and your code a secret because you obviously don't want everybody else to know what your hackers are creating. And you're going to get more and more employees and expand your headquarters so that you can house more employees and you can keep them fed and whatever. Employed, yeah, employed. You employ employees, you don't just feed them, you employ them. <laughs> but I also do like that they provide you with a little grid for research and development so you can be playing with your little polyominoes to see if they'll fit into the shapes that are out on the board. Because out on the board, there will be a number of different products that you're all working to try to create. And in order to do that, you have to slot in polyominoes in the exact open spaces available. And then you can innovate and create that product and put it out on the market. And then future players can copy your code exactly. And they do have to copy it exactly with the same pieces. So it's not as simple as creating a, a new different arrangement, you have set the standard for that product and it must be followed. And this looks fun. It's an economic polyomino game. And I like both of those things. Plus, it is a good price. It's 28 bucks US, $35 Canadian. And that's good. That's for the retail edition. The only difference really is the deluxe edition at $50 US or $64 Canadian, you get these extra plastic code tiles and you get nine metal coins for money. It feels like you don't need that whatsoever, but the retail edition feels like a pretty decent buy and one that I'm seriously contemplating. The shipping to the US is 12 bucks. It's 18 bucks to get to Canada, 18 bucks to get to some other places as well. 150 to Brazil. So feels like it might not be a great deal if you live in Brazil. But after shipping for me, it puts it at around that $55 Canadian realm and I think I would be okay paying that for this this type of game. This is a tricky one because that is going to retail but because Grail Games they're they're not necessarily a smaller publisher but I don't see many of their games in my personal channels so that is why I am contemplating it. Usually I'm saying just check in with retail see if you can get it another way 
I don't know if, if I will personally be able to, and so that's why I am interested in it, because the, the structure of it feels like it would be fun. You're just getting employees to get you the code to build the stuff to raise your economic value. That just, I don't know, that feels, it feels like it would be a lot of fun. I'm quite interested in it. And so if you're interested, check it out. That finishes next Tuesday, the 26th at 10.59 a.m. And that's it. That's it for the week. There's another collectible card game next Tuesday called Shadows of Something or Other, but I don't like collectible card games, so we ain't talking about that one either. <laughs> So that's it for the week. Every week I do a pick for me and a pick for you. The pick for me being the one that I am most personally interested in and the pick for you is something that I think has the most wide appeal. And obviously, maybe you could tell by my excitement, the only time I've really been legitimately excited uh, throughout the game. Oh no, that's not true. The kaiju roll and ride actually feels pretty good. But my pick for me is Silicon Valley. This one looks looks good. This is something that I legitimately might back, and I have until next week to decide if I'm going to do that. It's close for me. I, I, I like economic games. I really do. And the usage of the polyomino, basically using the polyomino as different resources, right? That's all it is. But these resources are slightly more malleable because they can be combined in different ways to get you more patents. And then when you have more patents, your evaluation of it as a company is going to keep on moving up. Yeah, this one looks really fun. I am excited. This is the reason why I do these crowdfunding countdowns. This is one that I would have just passed over and I didn't uh, realize that this actually seems as solid as it does. So I'm on, really on the fence for this one. That's definitely my pick for me. That's pretty much my pick for you. Uh, but to give you a different pick for you, I am again going to recommend none of these because nothing else jumps out to me as much as Silicon Valley. Instead, check out Humble Bundle for the next couple days, depending on when you're watching this, they have an Asmodee Steam bundle. So you can get Small World, Ticket to Ride, Splendor, Love Letter, Game of Thrones, Terraforming Mars, Blood Rage, all of those digital versions. There's Lord of the Rings, the confrontation card game, I think. You can get those as digital versions for $16 Canadian. Yeah, and the proceeds go towards charity. So. This is something that someone on Discord brought up and that I pulled the trigger on this week. Absolutely, it is a great deal. And it also kind of shows you what a great deal is and the amount of stuff you can get. I know it's a digital version and this stuff has been out for a long time. So yeah, I get it. It's not a physical copy of anything, but these are the deals that we look for here on this channel. And so I would be remiss to recommend anything else. I played through a little tester of each one of these games and the implementations seem fine, you know? They seem good. Terraforming Mars doesn't have an AI component, but you can play it solo. Blood Rage does, Ticket to Ride does. I can't actually play Splendor or Carcassonne because I only have a Mac and that was for Windows. So be sure to check out what operating system these sorts of things are. So instead, of course, I just put those up on the Discord for other people to take. Wow, what perks you get for being a patron. <laughs> anyway, yeah, this Humble Bundle seems like a really, it, it seems it is a really good deal. If you like digital board game implementations, check that one out. That's absolutely the pick for you. And it's not on Kickstarter, but uh, I just don't think anything this week blew me away, really. I, I mean, I'm leaning towards the, the kaiju roll and write, but really more because I had the most fun writing that segment over the actual game itself. <laughs> and everything else is eh, kind of underwhelming. So like anything, I always say this. This has been a common theme for the last uh, few weeks. Maybe it's just uh, depending on what's out on Kickstarter right now. There's going to be a lot of stuff. There's always a lot of stuff. And we can talk about these games and look at these games and get pretty much everything the game could offer us from just doing that versus spending $60, $70, $100, $150 dollars on something that we are not excited about. But I'm excited about the Humble Bundle. And I've enjoyed dipping my toes into that. I'm excited about all of the games that are on Board Game Arena as well. You don't have to spend money to play games online. Board Game Arena's catalog has expanded quite significantly in the last little while. So I played a game of Terra Mystica on there. That, that's always been there for a round. I played a game of Terra Mystica today with some friends online, and that was a great time as well. Anyway, that's my pick for you, Humble Bundle. Pick for me, though, Silicon Valley, I, I, I am excited about. I will be watching that campaign with interest for sure. So that's it. We made it to the end of the week, another week. 
Thank you so much for sticking around every week. Sorry I took a break last week. I, I also just want to say thanks if you liked that little post that I made on YouTube. YouTube can give you little posts that you can write things. And so I wrote, hey, I'm sick. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I try to keep the video production up as much as I can, but uh, I, just, I just couldn't do it. And I'm just so appreciative of the community here on YouTube as well. I know I talk about the Discord Patreon community as well, but like the community here on YouTube, you just watching these videos week after week, it means a whole lot. I love interacting with you. And, and I just am really appreciative of anyone who is like, yeah, don't worry about it. Like, it's okay to be sick because it is okay to be sick. It is okay to take some days off. And if you needed to hear that as well, you have my permission to do that. It's not gonna be the end of the world. People will be there for you and support you. And yeah, just thanks. Thanks to everybody who saw it and liked it or commented or whatever. I was just, I, I was a bit stressed because I, I have been working on this channel for almost a year, almost exactly a year coming up. I think in next week, maybe uh, 27th, I believe I put out seriously started doing consistent content. So I'm just very appreciative of the community that we have here on YouTube. And yeah, thanks. So yeah, let me know what you are excited about in the comments below what you're excited about this week. If I totally misread something and I'm an idiot, I love hearing that because I need to hear that because I, I know I am and it's just good for my ever inflating sense of self-worth to just stick it down and know that I'm a dumb idiot. Uh, <laughs> that helps. Uh, or if you're excited for things upcoming, whatever they might be, I love when you give me the heads up as well because that makes me take note of it. I always read every comment, obviously. I try to respond to everyone if I have something to say. But yeah, it's, it's great to know what people are excited about upcoming so I can make sure that I do focus on them as well. So thanks so much for being here. My name's Chris George. I do not have a catchphrase, but I hope you all had a fantastic weekend filled with lots of chocolate and you all got to hang out with Plucky for Bunny Day over on Animal Crossing. <laughs> and I'll see you in the next video.